was at the gym thinking about this uh, this uh, sort of default penchant for um, for rationalism, and so what I tried to do, you know, I'm, I'm on the elliptical machine, I'm I'm going and I'm sweating and I'm breathing. I tried to force my intellect to attend to everything that my senses were telling me, mm. from from the weight of my shirt against my chest to the the tactile sensation of, of the slight sweatiness of my hands on the elliptical. Were you the, demonstrating the intentionality of the mind? No. What I was trying to do is I was trying to uh, force my intellect to try and deal with the, what the senses do unconsciously. Oh, I see. So, so for people who want to denigrate sense, sensation and exalt intellection, try and force your intellect to attend to everything that your five senses are giving you. All the sounds, all the tactile sensations all the sights, what happened after about a minute of trying to do this, I was exhausted. I was, I was intellectually fatigued at doing this. And what I realized is that it's because the senses function unconsciously that they can do what they do. If the, if the intellect tried to attend to everything that the senses were doing all the time, it would be exhausting to the intellect. Just as the senses don't give us abstract universal reasoning, mm. which we tend to love so much, the intellect doesn't give us contact with the outside world. That's what the senses do. And so I think in, in very much the tradition of classical empiricism, we have to have a healthy respect for both these modes of knowing mm. that are qualitatively different from one another. We have sensation, we have intellection, and the mutual interpenetration of that gives us the complexity of human mind. So given all of that, what happens in, we said there isn't, there's no such thing as science, but there are the natural sciences. What happens in the natural sciences is that we have objects of study that are either closer to or more remote from our natural epistemic axis. Our natural epistemic access is based on the powers of sensation and the powers of the mind, right? So what Aquinas, and this is a, a great book about this. Uh, Peter Kreeft does a good job with this in the, in the latter half of his book, Socratic Logic. He, he explains some of this stuff. Uh, he, it, it, it's a sort of a shorthand epistemology if you don't want to get too deep into it. But the, the, way, the way in which we come to have ideas about things, and we talked about this a little bit earlier when we talked about the difference in knowledge between the child versus the adult versus the expert, right? Remember the apples? The way we come to understand at depth something is by induction. We, we come to, we experience uh, a kind of thing uh, multiple times. And through that process, we come to have a concept of the thing. So what happens to these sciences where, where the object is a, what they call a non-observable? Like for example, the early universe is a non-observable, it's gone. Whatever happens, it's gone. These things that happen at the level of particle physics are non-observables, we can't see them. We have, so what I said was, we have this natural epistemic range of human knowing. There are some sciences that deal with medium-sized objects. So for example, looking at the migration uh, patterns of whales in marine biology, is that a science? Yes, it takes, it takes observation and a, uh, over time, a noting of the kind of regularity of patterns of these animals, right? Um, so that is a science, but it's not a heavily quantitative science. We're not doing uh, uh, measurements on whale patterns down to the ninth decimal place past in, in the ninth place past the decimal, right? Um, so the quantitative aspect of something like botany or marine biology is really secondary to the sort of the macro observation of these events. So in those contexts, the, the scientists are, are basically unqualified realists. Here are blue whales, here are humpback whales, and here's their migration from 
to the Arctic and back up to wherever, whatever they do. I don't know. I'm not a bird biologist. No. <laughs> Fill in the blanks with data there. Um, so, so there's an unqualified realism when it comes to our inductive access to things like marine biology. We can see the, uh, the, um, the growth or the diminishing of like a coral reef system. We can see that and we can measure it, right? Um, so we have a rich inductive access to things like uh, animals, plants, you know. Now compare that to things like early cosmology and particle physics, right? We don't have, we don't have inductive access to these things, not, not at a macro level. So what happens is in the case of like say particle physics, we run these experiments over and over again. And then instead of uh, direct observation, we have indirect observation and measurement from these pieces of technology, like, uh, like the, the, the super colliders and things like that. And then we interpret those through these uh, theoretical reconstructions. So in my, uh, range of the natural sciences, I said, when it comes to these things like marine biology and maybe medicine, right, things that are dealing with these macro level objects in a fairly robustly inductive way, we can be unqualified realists regarding those uh, theories and, and the, the, uh, their, those objects. Right? When it comes to things that are very far away, like distant galaxies or or very, very small, these things that are non-observables. What we have to have in order to secure some level of what's called structural realism is we have to have a precise mathematical description of these objects. Now, there's a book that I have by a guy named John Losee, L-O-S-E-E -E or S-S-E-E, -E, and it's on the history of the philosophy of science. Mm. So not only do we, do we have issues in the philosophy of science, but now we've been doing the philosophy of science long enough that it's got its own, say, 150 year history. Mm. And now we have historians of science and we have historians of the philosophy of science. So talking about how philosophers of science have looked at science throughout the history of the philosophy of science. Anyway, what's beneficial in that book is there's a footnote that he has that's a description of how we detect positrons. And he says, what we do is we shoot hydrogen atoms through this cadmium ion solution. And then when we read this, uh, this kind of reaction where you have uh, a particle driven in this direction with this trajectory, with this, uh, with this energy signature, we say that was a positron because the positron is the only kind of particle that would cause this kind of reaction or response. Notice, what, he, what we're doing is we're not directly observing a positron doing these things. We're saying, theoretically, that a positron has this kind of uh, uh, energy, spin, whatever. And if it were to come into contact with a hydrogen atom in this solution, it should give us these results. When we observe these results, we say there was a positron. So we understand the nature of that thing by these highly specific quantifiable effects on other things that we can measure. So it would be reasonable to believe in the existence of positrons and electrons because they have these discernible properties. We, we can measure these effects with a level of quantitative precision. Okay. Now we shouldn't be unqualified realists because we don't have direct access. We, but I think we can be some strife of realists. And, and I think that is a, there's a strike of realism called epistemic structural realism. We don't know the nature of these quantum objects or these particle objects, but we do understand their mathematical properties. And so we, so in, like uh, if you've ever, you know, petted a dog, you know what petting a dog feels like. You don't know what being a positron is like, right? So, it just it just highlights the indirectness of our knowledge of these quantum. How, how does this relate to the theory of evolution? Then is it okay? Is it so, so the the reason the reason this is important is because when you read people like philosopher of science Philip Kitcher, 
or evolutionary activists like Eugenie Scott. One of the things they do regarding evolutionary theory is they say evolution is science. Evolution is science just like physics and chemistry is a science. If you're going to say that evolution is false or you're going to reject evolution as science, then, then you're rejecting all of science namely things like physics and chemistry. So the reason I wanted to put a, uh, a philosophy of science in place to say there are differences in the science, sciences. There's a difference between botany and marine biology, mm -hmm. and there's a difference between botany and marine biology in our epistemic access to those objects. Then there is chemistry, physics, particle physics, and strings, right? Now, so how are we um, scientific realists so our scientific realism about whales and trees is different than our scientific realism about strings and quarks. Now there's a continuity because I think as we can secure a mathematical description of these objects and their distinctions, we can be some type of realist for that. Now, what did we say about things like whales and trees? We have this rich inductive access to them and very little quantitative description of these things. We're not trying to describe trees or forests to nine places past the decimal point in precision in order to just understand their nature. We can understand their nature by directly interacting with them. Okay, the reason that's important is now we get to objects of natural history, right? Like Archaeopteryx, say. And the question becomes, how do we know the nature of something like Archaeopteryx? It looks kind of like a bird, it looks kind of like a lizard, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a rich inductive interaction with this animal. We don't. It's just a collection of bones in the earth. Now, one of the things that, I don't know if this is of interest to, to the students or not, but one of the things Peter Crave talks about in his book, Socratic Logic, is the different ways that terms are used. Like when I say water is H2O, when I say water, I'm using that as an essential term. I'm picking out the essence of this chemical compound. Water is different from alcohol, which is different from peroxide, even though there are all, all different arrangements of hydrogen and oxygen, right? There's another way to use a term that's called a nominalist use of a term, where I simply give something a name, right? And this is what we usually use for artifacts. We na usually name artifacts by their functions. Toaster, refrigerator, automobile, right? These are just names that we give things based on their functions. Well, something I looked at in the history of paleontology is that when you look at early pa paleontological texts, all the paleontologist is doing is saying, hey, we, we uncovered this thing. This, we know not what, and here's a sketch of it, and they'll sketch out Archaeopteryx, right? And they're like, you know, we, we really don't know this thing's evolutionary history. I really don't know what I'm looking at, but it seems to have features of wings, but also, you know, teeth, right? And it, like something like a lizard's tail. So whatever this thing is. So what I said, what I argued in my dissertation is that Early on in paleontology, these things had a nominalist, these terms like archaeopteryx had a nominalist intention. They were just naming this set of bones, giving it a, a placeholder name, right? Archaeopteryx. After 120 years of familiarity, I've got a, uh, I read a book by a, um, a professor of evolutionary biology out of Ohio, and he was livid over the evolution creationist debate. This is in the sort of mid nineties flavor. And he shows a picture of Archaeopteryx. He said, look, we have eight or nine representations of this species. So there are eight or nine specimens of, uh, uh, of this uh, animal. And then on the following page, you flip the page and um, what you see is a picture a drawn picture of a, an animal that has feathers, that has a, 
a, a, a beak, has a tail like a reptile, yeah. and flying through the air. So wh what early paleontologists understood about their own discipline is that, look, we don't know what's going on here. We're just piecing this stuff together as it comes. Fast forward 120 years, and this is something Dr. Uh, Norman Geisler talked about. He said, when it comes to the debate over evolution, one of the things that we have to overcome is evolutionary art. Because what the art does, you know, if you look at the bones in the earth, you go, yeah, I really don't know what we're looking at. But then when you look at a picture, this, represent, this, this recreation of this thing in flight, going through a, 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 a migration or a feeding or a breeding pattern, it gives the illusion that this term archaeopteryx, which was nominalist to begin with, it's just a name that we put on this I know not what, has become, has taken on this essentialist cast. Mm. So we talk about archaeopteryx in the same way that we would talk about an oak tree or a sperm whale or a, a, a jaguar. And it gives it this, it gives us the impression that we have the same sort of inductive, rich inductive access to these bones in the earth that we do other medium-sized objects that we study in things like botany and marine biology. But that's absolutely not the case. So on a, on, a, uh, on a fundamental epistemological analysis, you go, well, paleontology, what, is the, what are their objects of study? Their objects of study are these medium-sized objects, yeah. say three inches when it comes, you know, three inches when it comes to, you know, Burgess Shale type uh, tetrapods or, or, or uh, what are those things called? Um, up to, you know, things like, uh, you know, woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and things like yeah, that. Sure. So that's what they're dealing with, these medium-sized objects. The question is, what sort of inductive access do we have to them? The answer is none. None. Um, David Ropp, who worked at the University of Chicago, the late David Ropp, he talked about, just in terms of the dinosaur lineage, he said, we have, uh, we have about 360 different distinct dinosaur species. And he said that it was either... 50% or 80% are known from one single specimen. Wow. So, so say, say it's the 50% number. We have 360 species, 180 of which are known from a single specimen. And sometimes it's not even a full specimen. It's a, it's a, frag, it's a fragmented specimen. So the question becomes, just as an, as an honest sort of philosophy of science, you go, should we, given, given the nature of the objects of study of paleontology, which is sort of the, which is one of the fundamental uh, disciplines that feed into an overall evolutionary. The question is, given the kind of access we have to the kind of objects that paleontology studies, should we, as a, dis, as a, as a philosophy of science disposition, should we be more realists regarding the, the, this theory and its, and its uh, approach and statements, or should we have a more anti-realism, right? And so the, the project of my dissertation was to cut off the kind of rhetorical strategy of somebody like a Eugenie Scott, mm -hmm. to basically treat all the sciences the same, that our, uh, that our epistemic attitude is either we believe the sciences are true or we think they're false, right? If you think evolution's false, you must think physics and chemistry is false too. And I said, no, I don't treat all the sciences the same. I don't treat particle physics the same way I treat botany, right? In, in my realism, anti-realism uh, disposition. Then when it comes to evolutionary theory, you go, okay, well, what are the objects of evolutionary theory? The majority of them are, I mean, they, yeah, they may study mutation rates in, in, certain, uh, in, in certain generations of things they're actually studying like uh, bacteria or something like that. But by and large, what they're studying are um, objects of natural history, paleontology. And you go, well, um, I don't think that paleontology can study its objects with either the same inductive access that a marine biologist has or with the sophisticated levels of quantification that the quantum mechanism has, right? So those two parameters not being met, 
induction or quantification leads me to believe that the kinds of data that they're dealing with should be approached more on an anti-realist line than a realist line. Certainly not an unqualified realism, but this is important that the debate, be, because, because people haven't zoomed out to take a philosophy of science perspective on the evolution design debate, and they certainly haven't zoomed out to take a uh, an epistemolo a, a deep dive in, in, to an epistemological analysis on how humans know things. The debate often come, becomes about whether or not Darwinism is true or false, right? Without asking the question, what kind of theory is it to begin with? Is it, should we be more realist toward the theory or should we be more or anti-realist? And if we should be anti-realist, what kind of anti-realism should we adopt? Because even within anti-realism, there's a, there's a spectrum of options about how we look at scientific theories. So when it comes to the, the different options in anti-realism, what I found is that uh, there's, a, there's a particular philosopher of science, Boss Van Frossen, which is fun to say. And in the early 1980s, he developed a, a type of um, anti-realism known as constructive empiricism where he says that um, basically scientists don't just know directly what's going on in reality. What they do is they reconstruct reality according to uh, th theoretical pre-commitments in their mind. And when I, uh, having done all this research in the philosophy of science, I thought this, and one of the things that is a criticism of Bob's, Ben Frost's position is that if scientific theories are these kind of empirical constructs, one of the consequences of that is that they're almost impervious to uh, um, anomalies, mm. data that don't fit. And I thought, okay, well, that doesn't fit with the history of like, say, astronomy, because certainly in a history of astronomy, there are anomalies, there are responses to those anomalies in terms of theoretical change, right? The, the move from, uh, from Ptolemaic to Copernican theory, right? So there are ways in which the data is able to influence the theory, but, if Van Frossen is right about, uh, if there was a theory that is largely an empirical construct in nature, one of, the, one of the properties of that theory is that it would be largely impervious to anomalous data. Mm -hmm. And having read uh, Michael Denton's Evolution of Theory and Crisis written back in 1985, right. the, the question is, if all these anomalies have mounted against neo-Darwinism and yet it's still the dominant paradigm, what could account for that? And the answer is that the theory itself doesn't rely on realist principles mm. because it is largely an empirical construct. The best way to understand the nature of evolutionary theory is as a Van Frossian empirical construct, not along the lines of traditional realism. But what we have in the creation evolution debate is we have the creationists saying that that Darwinism is false, and you have the Darwinists saying, no, it's true. But what Van Frossen says is that um, believing a theory is true or false is a realist approach to the theory. An empirical construct, he says, we, we don't talk about whether it's true or false. We just look at the evidence and say, is the evidence empirically adequate to support the theory? You know. And you either accept it as empirically adequate or you deny that it is empirically adequate, but you don't believe it's true or believe it's false. These are two different epistemic attitudes to the So what I argue to my dissertation is that we should not be evaluating evolutionary theory on realist terms, but rather we should cast it in the light of uh, constructive empiricism, a type of anti-realism, and then what we say about the theory is not that it's false, is that it's empirically inadequate, is that the, the, the theory has some certain entailments that the data doesn't support. And so it, it's, what I, it's a process of what I call lowering the epistemic bar. So we're not trying to prove that Darwinism is false. That's a pretty high epistemic hurdle. We lower the epistemic bar by casting it in light of Van Frosten's constructive empiricism and then merely say, not that evolution is false, but that evolutionary, uh, neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory is, is empirically inadequate for all the reasons that the creationists in the design proponents say. You know, Cambrian explosion doesn't explain whatever.
you know, uh, challenges from, from information and biochemistry. That, yeah, for all these reasons, I think that this empirical construct should be understood as empirically inanimate. You think that'll have any effect? Uh, I'm a philosopher, so the fact that I that that I was able to sort of mull through and and uh, create this philosophical analysis was was satisfying to me. The question is, will it have an impact on the on the on the sciences? I don't know, but it should have an impact on our, our apologetics. Mm. So so my goal was to use the tools of philosophy to develop a philosophy of science perspective on the debate between these two sciences in order to say, in order to treat neo-Darwinism uniquely, apart from the rest of the sciences, to isolate it in our analysis. So we can't just say, well, the way, whatever, you, whatever your attitude toward neo-Darwinism is, that's your same attitude toward physics and chemistry. You know, no, no, that's not, that's not true. And, mm -hmm. so, and so what this is, it's a, it's a tool for apologists to use in a rhetorical context that really puts neo-Darwinists off their footing because now you're not debating over this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence. You've moved the, you've moved the discussion a level up in abstraction. Now we're doing a philosophy of science analysis of this particular theory in the sciences. You go, and most, most scientists are, are not equipped to do, to deal with a rigorous philosophical analysis. So I, I think, I imagine the, the biology student on campus who's, or, or the, the, uh, the Christian student on campus who's talking with a biology major who's died in the wool, full-blown neo-Darwin, Darwinian. And, and imagine that person saying to the, to the Darwinists, you go, well, based on my, on my um, continuum of understanding on the realism, anti-realism, uh, you, know, you know, continuum on, in uh, the philosophy of science, where I locate your particular theory is on the anti-realism side, specifically as an empirical construct. So the question becomes, uh, is there any way to invalidate your, your construct? And I don't think there is, but, um, but for these reasons that you pull from the creationist side of the debate, for these reasons, I think neo-Darwinism is empirically inadequate. Mm -hmm. That there are certain lines of evidence that it should be able to explain that it doesn't. And, and therefore, we should be looking for a different theory of how to explain natural history, human origins, right? So that that, that at least gives us a, a completely third way to to approach this debate that it, that has la largely become stagnant, I think, in the last ten years or so. Well, thank you.